Hello, everybody. Hello. So, so this is the problem when you have someone like Nira in your life who knows you so well. She's like, literally, I have a scuffle in the back because here's your handheld mic. I'm like, I'll speak from the podium. No, you always use a handheld. They know me enough to know that I like to roam when I speak. Um, but I want you to know uh, that Nira has been a hero for me, uh, not just in her current role, but she was one of those people in law school. She tried to shine some light to me. If anything, I'm just reflecting hers because she was one of those sources of strength even back then that understood that Charles Hamilton Houston, I think, said it. Either you're a lawyer for social justice or you are a leech upon society. And she said, <laughs> and she lived that principle that education is a waste unless it's being used to empower other people. And to see her career blossom and get to this place where she is now, uh, at a time, there is, uh, I think, a story in American history that often it's the right leader that appears at the right time uh, when their country needs them. And this is a time that not only her, but this organization itself uh, is an urgently needed organization for our country. So I want to thank her for her leadership and the entire CAP staff. Um, I want to give honor to everyone who is here or who has been here. We all need to begin to see ourselves uh, as patriots. Before we're Democrats, before we're progressives, we need to see ourselves as patriots. And for me, for Nira to ask me to give the closing remarks, the final remarks, after you all have heard so many speakers, uh, many of them people that are my friends and my colleagues who uh, are my partners, uh, I, I, it's just such an honor to be able to speak to a group of patriots after a long conference and get the responsibility of taking it home. And so to do that, I, I would literally like to take you home for a second to where my mom lives uh, because I, and this is my attempt to get uh, some points with everybody here, um, who I went to go visit uh, uh, in the lead up to Mother's Day. Um, uh, my mom now no longer lives in New Jersey. She has moved to Vegas. Um, and I, uh, <laughs> yes, mama lives in Vegas. And she has, uh, I think it's an inherited trait because my grandmother was like this. She knows which slot machines will pay off and when. Um, <laughs> But, but my mom, I went out there because she was performing uh, in a play. And her senior citizen community, her retirement community was putting on a play. And, and immediately before she even had to ask, I knew I had a karmic obligation because she was there for every one of my grade school plays and now the world was coming full circle um, and I had to be there for her. And so I flew out uh, less than 24 hours on the ground, uh, taking the red eye back here, but I sat in the front row, and it was like God had turned the tables. I was now one of those uh, maybe annoying parents who sat in the front row. I had my recording device in my hand, uh, um, literally uh, recording everything. The senior citizen behind me after the play thanked me because he said, I'm, I, I'm, I'm farsighted. I can see things closer up, and I could look in your video uh, and see the whole thing so clearly. Thank you for that, sir. But the moment I want to bring you to, it was actually a powerful moment to me because my mom was playing the Red Queen in Alice in Wonderland. And, um, and, and so there came a moment, though, that you all know that suddenly had me uh, very excited and suddenly connected me to deep chords within my own family and within our country. And it was this moment where uh, Alice says, uh, one can't believe in impossible things, she says. And then it, it, what the... What the queen responds is, I dare say you haven't had much practice then. When I was your age, I always did it for a half an hour a day. Why sometimes I believed in as many as six impossible things before breakfast. And the reason why that touched me, and I know this is the story not just of my family, but everyone here's family is when I sat down with the elders in my family, my aunts and uncles and my grandparents, the story of America that I heard was not the story of simple glory and, and abundance. No, it was a story of profound struggle. It was a story of pain and hardship. It was a story of setbacks and failures and frustrations. It was a story of feeling like you're fighting out there in the grassroots when your very government is supporting things that are working against you, your liberty, and your justice. When you witness firsthand levels of discrimination and violence 
My grandfather told me stories about people escaping the South when he was living in Detroit and literally having to shuttle them out of the country for their safety into Canada. It made me understand that when my family, and I know yours as well, spoke of the impossible dream of America, it, it, it went so much deeper than the glory and the remembrance of some days gone past that really haven't been. I love the book, The Fire Next Time. It is this book by James Baldwin where he tells in brutal shape, uh, brutal truth, it's a kind of writer today that like a ta Coates of his times, where he talks with unflinching realism about the problems of America. And in this entire book, he does not pull a punch. But then at the end, and in fact, this, this, this page in his book, he took some criticism for it because it just, some people said it was, sounded too Pollyannish. He strikes this note of hope amidst all that he described, calling to the conscience of our country to do impossible things. Baldwin writes, I know what I'm asking you is impossible, but in our time, as in every time, the impossible is the least we can demand. And one is, after all, emboldened by the spectacle of human history in general, an American Negro history in particular, for it testifies to nothing less than the perpetual achievement of the impossible. Now, I want to tell you all, Baldwin was writing about American black history, but the truth of our country is story after story, so many, so vast, that our finite minds can barely contain the stories of heroic actors, everyday Americans, who did extraordinary things under unimaginable circumstances. So much of what we take for granted right now was because of folks like Baldwin who answered the call to do impossible things. You pick a segment of our society, the suffrage movement with its brutality, women literally dying for the cause of our country, Alice Paul, Mary Church Terrell, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, the heroism of labor activists, literally at a time that if you were organizing, you didn't just get a threat to lose your job, you got a threat to lose your life. People like Eugene Debs, A. Philip Randolph, abolitionists who had the boldness, before I'll be a slave, I will be buried in my grave. Nat Turner, Sojourner Truth, William Lord Garrison, civil rights activists whose names aren't even that well known. Like Fred Shuttlesworth had his home bombed, his wife chain whipped, himself stabbed, but kept on fighting for his impossible dream of America. These are our ancestors. This is our roots people who never surrendered to circumstances, who kept on dreaming. I have to tell you right now, when I hear my mom utter something from Lewis Carroll, and it, it, it actually fortifies me as I get on a red eye to fly back to Washington, in my head were the songs from a, a kid in a black church in Closter, New Jersey, the spirituals that were being sung that my mom would impress upon me, you're hearing those now in the 1980s as a little boy, but those were the songs that sourced us. Ain't nobody gonna turn me around. Ain't nobody gonna turn me around. I'm gonna keep on a walking. I'm gonna keep on a talking, marching down to freedom land. One of my favorite songs that I, I was playing in my apartment last night, different renditions of different choirs of different groups, was just this concept 
of keeping your hand on the plow when my way gets dark as night. I know the Lord will be my light. Keep your hand on the plow, hold on. Keep your hand on the plow, hold on. Now, I walk the halls of Congress. I I'm sorry, I can't walk in that building. I can't go on that Senate floor, no matter how despicable the CRA I'm forced to vote on is. I can't lose sight of the history we share that I am a black man in America walking onto the floor of the Senate. And the sacrifices of folk black and white, male and female, Christian, Jewish, Muslim, all that it took for me to be the fourth elected African American in the history of our country to that body. Talk about people who kept their hand on the plow. Robert Smalls, a name most of us don't know. This is the, 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 the full history we have of heroic actors. This was a slave who was lent to a slave ship after the outbreak of the Civil War. And immediately he was plotting to break free. When the Confederates left the ship one night, leaving him and some other slaves on it, he took control of the ship, put on the captain's garb, sailed his ship right by Fort Sumter that had surrendered to the Confederates. They looked at the ship, seeing the captain there, didn't think anything was wrong. He turns his ship and he sails as quickly as he can towards the Union blockade, knowing that the Union Army would fire on a Confederate ship. He uses white clothing to raise up and wave. They were literally preparing to fire, and they recognize, wait a minute, that's a white flag flying. He actually gets to safety. He becomes such a hero. Northern newspapers were writing about him. He is credited with one of the reasons why we let blacks fight in the Civil War. He himself is credited with recruiting 5,000 American blacks to fight, and many of them died brutally in a civil war for freedom. He then, after the civil war, gets elected to the South Carolina legislature. We talk about public education in our party. Well, he passed his legislation creating about the first public schools legislated by a state in America. Then, he gets nominated to Congress and walks the same hallways that I get to walk now. Look, the end of his life is not great. He literally goes back to the South Carolina State House and is there as an elected representative after Reconstruction, one of the most bloodiest periods of domestic terrorism we have ever seen, and the South Carolina legislature strips blacks of their voting rights and he has to vote on it. He has to be there. Two years before his death, at a time where lynching is all over this country, this man literally, when two people, black men are accused of being murderers and a lynch mob forms, he goes and disperses blacks throughout the town of Buford, South Carolina, and then lets the rumor fly that if these two men are lynched, they will burn the town to the ground. And the sheriff protected the two black men from the lynch mob. He died in a house that he bought from his slave master. It's one of the stories from American history that folk don't know. And I wonder how now I hear I hear folk despairing. Talk about setbacks. To be elected to Congress as a black man, to have to watch voting rights being stripped, it wouldn't be till the next century when people like John Lewis and others fought to open up doors for voting rights. It wouldn't be till years later, even after that, that a black man would return to the United States Senate. We have so much power us as Americans. 
if we keep our hands on the plow and keep fighting and don't let anything turn us around. Now, I know we're in this time where folk are, are despairing. I, I know that. But one of the greatest gifts of my life is, is, a, is a community in Newark, New Jersey. I grew up in the northeast of the state. I grew up in the suburbs. Yeah, my parents had to fight an unimaginable civil rights battle in 1969 to move into the town literally working with a fair housing council to get white family to pose as my parents to put a bid on the house. And then when my father and the volunteer lawyer show up, <laughs> my father's lawyer gets punched in the face by the real estate agent and a dog gets sicked on him. But I grew up in, in, in unimaginable circumstances that my father told me you are living dreams that were impossible, seemed impossible to me when I was a kid. You're living a life that was dangerous, a dangerous dream to articulate if you were your grandfather. But I tell you this, when I moved to Newark, New Jersey, I didn't need to open history books to, to see heroism. I began to meet people who, under unconscionable circumstances, refused to stop believing in America. Housing rights activists, civil rights activists, fighting against injustices that we as a country didn't think necessarily deserved us all taking the streets, losing the understanding that King said so articulately a generation before that injustice anywhere is in America a threat to justice everywhere, that we're all caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in one single garment of destiny. Somehow that garment has been ripped where we aren't even conscious of other struggle, our neighbors, our fellow Americans. I'm so happy that Flint, Michigan is getting so much attention, but Reuters just released a report that was the truth. Over a thousand communities have lead levels in their children's blood right here in America, four times what Flint's children have right now. When I moved to Newark in the 90s, this is what I saw. What is it like to live in a neighborhood where you see a parent looking at you with a lead-poisoned child. I'm proud that I still live in that community today. When I listen to politicians like our president talk about inner cities in a way that is not appealing to our heart and to our hope and to the light, but demeaning and degrading those spaces, not realizing the heroes who have been fighting come to my neighborhood. I may be a U.S. senator, but the folk in my community don't care that much about my title. I live in a community, my census tract, our median income is $14,000 per household. And this is before this president got sworn in over 100 days ago. We had fights. When we wanted to plant in, in the soil of our city, urban gardening, the state stepped in and said, you can't do that because there's too much lead in the ground. When this Congress wouldn't pass reauthorized legislation that Reagan reauthorized, that Mitch McConnell voted for, to clean up Superfund sites, they wouldn't reauthorize the small tax on polluting industries, what do people in my community think where we have two Superfund sites where the Passaic River is still polluted with the Agent Orange that was dumped into it? And we now know with longitudinal evidence that children born within three miles of a Superfund site have 20% higher rates of autism and birth defects. In my community, I've got officers who are fighting every day to, to stem the tide of gun violence. 
Literally, when, when gunfire erupts, I've seen it when I was mayor, they don't wait, they charge into places with no situational awareness, putting themselves and their lives on the line, recovering guns that were obtained illegally by people with criminal records. This issue of universal background checks to those cops in my community, this is not a policy discussion. This is the difference between life and death. I have a friend of mine, Natasha Laurel. She is this amazing woman. They call her Mama Tasha where she works because she has this heart. She takes care of the folks that work in her IHOP with her. But these issues that we as progressives are fighting for, talk to Miss Laurel for a little while. Talk to Mama Tasha. She works a full-time job. She tries to catch shifts in other places, but guess what? We pay for her housing. Because in this country, you could work a full-time job, catch extra shifts, especially if you live places like the New York, New Jersey area, you don't live above the poverty line. We pay for her food stamps. These are costs that this corporations just outsource onto all of us. And think about the trials that so many in my neighborhood that Mama Tasha faced when her child is sick, one of her boys has asthma. Literally, our IHOP on Bergen Street is across the street from a hospital. Her son rushed to the emergency room, is in that hospital, and this mom has to make the choice because we are one of the only industrialized nations on the planet Earth that doesn't have paid family leave. She has to make the choice whether to give up her shift and visit her child and lose out on that money, which could be the difference between her family having food or not, or staying at work while her child suffers with not just the, the debilitating effects of asthma, but with fear. This is the country that we live in, a nation where the basics come to my block, see where I live, down the street as a senior citizen building, we still have a nation that while people down here in Washington talk about cutting Social Security or privatizing it, we still have five million seniors that live in poverty still on their Social Security checks. Come to my neighborhood across the street as a drug treatment center. Do like I've done. Sit in the circle of the men and listen to the stories about how a criminal justice system treats people who are addicted and churns them into a system that debilitates them, that doesn't treat their disease. I tell you all of this to tell you, we have an impossible dream in America that has yet to be made real. And this is before there's a Donald Trump. I'm so happy to see activism and marching and organizing, but I'm telling you right now, if we make this all about Donald Trump, we've seen demagogues before, we've seen public demeanors in McCarthyism, Father Conklin come and go. My calling is not to have this party defined by what we're against or who we're against. We must be defined by the dream of America for all Americans. Now, don't get me wrong. I am upset about Donald Trump. I've watched over this last 100 plus days a guy who literally tells his supporters one thing and then gets into the White House and does things that are 100% contrary to what he said and what he promised. It's astonishing to me how someone can speak out of both sides of their mouth it's astonishing to me that his CRAs take away people's ability to better save for retirement, allow people to pollute our streams and rivers, take away people's access to preventative health, 
and family planning. All of that, to me, is astonishing that he can do those things. Not to mention this recent stuff that, to me, is more out of a Tom Clancy novel than it is should be out of our reality. I had a person call me today and talk to me. I, I, I couldn't believe it after the Russians literally attack us, cyber attacks, attack our election. Literally, his associates are under federal investigation. Literally, he seems to give better access to the Oval Office to the Russian press than the American press. And then he fires the very person that's investigating folks. This person said to me that, hey, Truman had a sign that said on his desk, the buck stops here. Trump should have one that says the ruble stops here. <laughs> this is surreal times. Don't get me wrong. There are real issues that necessitate us resisting and us fighting. But I want to let you all know our party cannot just be about that. The trends in our country are too disturbing. And in fact, if you think about it, Trump is a symptom of a problem. He's not the problem. This country was fought for by Irish immigrants who built factories and, and pushed our country into prosperity by black slaves whose labor helped fuel fortunes in this country by Chinese immigrants who built the transcontinental railroad by Mexican immigrants who produced food and hope and, and, and put the things on the table that we eat every day, creating extraordinary wealth. And then activists and progressives help to fight battles and win more equality, more opportunity. Legislation from, federal house, from the federal Congress to state houses helped to give us rights and privileges. So many things for us to be proud of. We became the envy of the world. But if you look right now, if you look at where America just over my lifetime has gone from being number one on the planet Earth to where we are now, on issues of the competitiveness of our democracy, indices that are kept by OECD and the World Economic Forum. The trends in our country are indeed troubling. We know that today in everything from pre-K enrollment to high school to college graduation rates, we're now being outranked by our peer nations. Other countries are investing in apprenticeship programs and training programs. Look at what's going on in Germany. In Newark, when I went to my manufacturers to get more jobs and opportunity, I said, what do you need? The first thing they said to me is, we can't find machinists. Other countries are making meaningful investments in job training, but we are not. Things that could be making a huge difference for our people, for our economy, and for global competitiveness. Other countries are seeing that lowering the bars to education in Germany, the cost of college is 4% of median income. In Canada, it's like 6 to 7%. In England, about 7%. In America, 52% of median income to go to college. Other countries have decimated, slashed rates of child poverty. In America, still stubbornly, one out of every five children in America born into poverty. Other countries are investing in their infrastructure. America, we inherited from our grandparents the best infrastructure on the planet Earth, and we have trashed it. Literally, engineers estimating about $3, billion, $3 trillion of infrastructure debt. And we've fallen even out of the top 10 of infrastructure. And our country is at a 20-year low an investment in infrastructure necessary for expanding economic opportunity. And when it comes to the sciences, we are the, one of the greatest civilizations on the planet Earth for investing our public resources in science and technology that have expanded businesses and job opportunities from our batteries on our iPhones to the touch screens to the satellite navigation. All of those things are our collective investment in government research. But now, China outstripping us, Europe outstripping us in investments in research and the sciences. We as a nation are falling behind in expanding opportunity for all. And we're leading in the areas we should not lead in. 
wasting public treasure, whether it's leading in child poverty or leading in probably one area of infrastructure investment we shouldn't want to lead in. With just 5% of the globe's population, we've got 25% of the globe's prison population. And during the time I was in law school with Nira to the time I became mayor of Newark, we were putting trillions of dollars, billions of dollars, into our investments in prisons, building a new prison in America every 10 days. And so I want to fight in this climate. I want to dedicate myself, but we cannot just be a party of resistance. We've got to be a party that's reaffirming that American dream. We can't just be a party that's focused on the person in the White House. We've got to be focused on those folks in inner cities, in factory towns, the grassroots of our country. That's where our attention needs to be. We've got to be a nation and a people, and especially a party that reignites that conviction that this will be the country of impossible dreams, that that is the essence of the American dream. We've got to be a nation that says we are about justice and security and opportunity and security that doesn't just mean fighting against terrorism and, and, and keeping us safe from foreign threats, but security that means all Americans, regardless of how they pray or whether they wear a hijab or have a bindi, all Americans are free from violence and discrimination. We've got to be a nation that's focused on justice and understands that justice means working 40 hours a week shouldn't leave you leaving in poverty. We've got to be a nation about opportunity. And opportunity means we become a party of growth and innovation, of technology, but we can never be a country that accepts that growth means just billionaires and billionaires get richer and richer and the poorest get stuck in poverty, that technology and innovation shouldn't be celebrated for how many billionaires we create, but how well we do in lifting people out of poverty. That technology can't be about transforming work for the better where people are contract workers that don't have retirement security, but that work means that you have true security for yourself and your family. And so I believe what our history shows us. And King said it so eloquently. The arc of the universe bends towards justice. But make no mistake, it, it, it doesn't happen automatically. We have to bend it. I believe that we can produce an economy that works for everybody, but we must build it. I believe that we can be a nation that has health care for all, but we must fight for it. I believe that we can have a day in this country where America leads not just in our wealth for the richest or the size of our army, but that we set that impossible dream that we have the best K through 12 public education, that we will lead again in the quality of opportunity, that will lead again in eradicating poverty, that will lead again in social mobility, that will lead in investing in science, that will lead in conquering the threat of climate change and that will lead the globe like the torchbearers, leading the globe to greater peace and prosperity. And so this moment, as we end an incredible conference, we've got to summon a greater courage, the courage that our generations before us, our ancestors have showed us, people without titles or political office, the courage that they demonstrated through their sacrifice and their service to this republic. And for that, there's, there's no special formula. It's work, work, work back into the fields of our democracy. Work, work, work back into the roots, grass roots. Work, work, work back to getting folk woke, waking up sleeping people, tending to the hurt, rallying the able, and igniting the dream all over again. We are Democrats and we must be patriots who work and sweat, work and organize and work and never let the dream get smaller. Hands upon the plow. Hold on. Hands upon the plow. Langston Hughes wrote a poem just about that, giving 
deference to generations who through song and spirit and faith forged a new America. Let me end with this poem. He said, America, land created in common, dream nourished in common. Keep your hands on the plow, hold on, hold on. If the house is not finished, don't be discouraged, builder. If the fight is not won, don't be weary, soldier. The plan and the pattern is here, woven from the beginning into the warp and wolf of America. A long time ago, an enslaved people heading towards freedom made up the song, keep your hand on the plow, hold on, hold on. A song long time ago, a people heading towards freedom made up a song, keep your hands on the plow, hold on, hold on. My fellow Democrats, my fellow patriots, we just go back into the fields and put our hands on the plow. We must ignite the dream of our country with our hands forever on the plow. We have unfinished work to be done. Our hands must remain on the plow. And I know in my heart and I know in my spirit, if we continue with that conviction, if we're willing to do the work, if we're willing to stay steady, then not only will we overcome the obstacles that seem impossibly large, but we will usher in a greater era for our country where we make more real and more true to more people the spirit of our nation, that we will be a nation with liberty and justice for all. Thank you.